Hello everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel for another audio. Hope you guys are doing well today. Hope you guys enjoyed your past week. Um, in today's audio I will be having a conversation with Jason Acosta. Uh, Jason Acosta allowed me to interview him to ask him a couple of questions and he of course gave a bunch of good answers that I think are real informative and I think you guys will learn a lot from them. Uh, so I hope you guys benefit a lot from this Q&A that I have with Jason Acosta and I hope you guys enjoy it. So without further ado, here is Jason Acosta. Hello, Jason. Yes. How's it going, my man? Going good, Ryan. How about yourself? Going pretty good. Um, I'm glad to have you on the show. There's a lot of good things people say about you out there in the Facebook world. Uh, you seem to start it up. A pretty big stir in the IO community with the with everything you've been bringing over YouTube lately, and I wanted to have you on. Uh, um, you say a lot of good things that I actually like. I, I enjoy listening to your channel, and uh, just wanted to have you come on here and share a couple of thoughts with us. Yeah, definitely, man. It's uh, it's good good to be on. Um, I actually enjoy your YouTube channel as well. I, I'm happy that there's uh, other people out there, kind of you know, pushing forth the, the truth of IO and, um, you know, not not to kill people's hope or anything, but just to give people a different look at um, the scriptures, which I believe and I'm sure you believe um, makes it more understandable and, and, and a lot more clear than anything I've ever heard, you know. Totally agree. Yeah, totally agree on that. Well, uh, if you don't mind, go ahead and give the people a little rundown about how you came into preterism. Um, and just what you're seeing right now with everything you've been studying. Sure. Um, so I had uh, been brought up in, you know, basic, I guess you'd call it a Christian traditional kind of home where uh, my parents who um, were great parents and everything, but didn't really, um, you know, didn't really walk the walk kind of thing. In other words, they were definitely loving, godly parents. My mom is, you know, has always been a woman of prayer, I guess you would call her. Um, but in terms of like actually getting out there and preaching the gospel and um, obeying the commands of Jesus to take the gospel to the ends of the world. And mind you, they're futurists. So um, they both believe that we're still preaching the gospel and the end is in the future and the end is near right. and all this. So, um, you know, there was never any emphasis on preaching the gospel. I, I probably never even saw my parents preach the gospel to anybody, um, you know, other than, you know, the, the people from church that would maybe come over, they would fellowship. But in terms of actually adding, quote unquote, lost souls to the kingdom, um, there was nothing of the sort. So I was, you know, kind of a, a rebel child. I, I went to church as a, a young pup. Um, and ended up leaving, um, you know, and telling them that I didn't really want to go. I think when I was maybe 12 or 13, when I was just heading in towards high school, I pretty much kind of rebelled and said, ah, I'm, I'm done with it, you know. And they were they were um, strict to, to a point, but not, you know, overbearing where they would force me to do things. Um, so I ended up, you know, backing away from the church and, and kind of just did my own thing and, and went through life and, you know, experienced all the same kind of things that most, I guess, young males would and, um, you know, went through the party phase and, you know, experimented with different things that I probably shouldn't have and whatnot. And then um, got to a point in when I was, I believe I was 27 at the time. Uh, this was in 2011, if my calculations are correct. But um, got to a point where I uh, just kind of really was broken, you know, like I had gone through a set of circumstances in my life that really kind of rock my core and it was like you know the the invincible attitude that i had prior had kind of taken a turn and i was like wow i'm you know i'm i'm pretty down in the dumps right now you know 
Um, and from the surface, everything looked good. And, you know, the, I had a great job and, you know, everything I could want materially, but um, relationship troubles and different things of that nature kind of kicked me to the ground and, and I was left kind of scratching my head. So there was a, a morning um, where I was just really broken and kind of, you know, down in the dumps. And I uh, actually got on my knees and just like cried out to God. Now, remember, I, I'm an atheist at this point. So um, I really don't believe anything. I just kind of heard, you know, what my parents had told me about this supposed God of the Bible and whatnot. So I didn't really have any knowledge of like God or the Bible. I just kind of heard the name Jesus and stuff. And so I, I just kind of threw up my hands one morning and just like, you know, whelped or yelped out to God to like, you know, help me because I was in a lot of pain and, and everything. And and it was pretty instant, instant. It was just a, like a miraculous type of uh, feeling that came over me and removed my pain instantly. And it was, it was quite, uh, shocking to say the least. And, and, um, it kind of like rocked my world. So that, that moment where like everything was kind of taken away from me in a split second, like sort of set me on a, a course to, to really try to get in tune with more spiritual things and figure out, you know, a, who is God, uh, and B what the heck just happened to me, you know? Mm. Um, and so, so I, uh, and, and mind you, I'm not the type of person who t believes in ghosts and, you know, all this supernatural stuff, like, you know, the dispensationalists who believe that, you know, they he heal sore big toes and whatnot. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's just not me. So this, this really kind of like rocked my world. And, um, in instantly I kind of like picked up a Bible, I would say maybe that same day, if not the day, day later for the first time and, and started reading it. And what I did instantly was I inserted myself into uh, the New Testament anywhere I could. I'm like, yeah, this is about me. This is about me, you know? Right. Uh, and so it just, it just seemed like the natural thing to do. You just kind of fall in line with your family's tradition. And um, I became, you know, obviously a futurist and um, did the whole futurist thing for a year, uh, dispensational flaming futurist. And then from there, I went into the Amil camp, um, joined a more reformed Christian church, which was basically like going to a funeral every Sunday morning. Um, and, you know, did that whole thing for about a year or so. And then it was maybe two years in, I, I discovered partial preterism um, through a book that I was reading. Um, and it just didn't, it didn't really, um, give too much detail, just kind of like ran through the different, you know, eschatological viewpoints. And so I had discovered partial preterism and I said, yeah, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. Like I could never really put my finger on Matthew 24, but this, this guy's, you know, making a lot of valid points. Of course, he still kept the door open for a future coming. Um, but then as I started to look into that, it was maybe, I don't know, two or three weeks in, um, that I realized that wow, everything might be totally fulfilled, you know? Um, and I had uh, come across a couple videos from Preston at that time. And, and I just like really went hard and looked at it for a few weeks. And I realized that, you know, if, if I'm going to really be honest here, I can't take the partial view. I have to, I have to agree that everything's been fulfilled. You know, there's, there's not two different ends being spoken of in scripture. They're all winding down to that one final glorious end, you know? Um, right. And so that uh, sort of led me into full preterism. And I uh, began being a full preterist. That was probably two years in. So for about the next three years, I was a full pre. I wrote uh, a book that Don K. Preston, Preston um, approached me and wanted to work together. He published it. It was called The Kingdom of Christ. Of course, now he burns that thing in bonfires. But um, <laughs> so. <laughs> But I did write that book and it was very well received. It was from the inconsistent full prep position that says, you know, everything's fulfilled. The judgment and all is behind us, but we're still being saved today beyond that final judgment. And, and from that final judgment just made no sense. Um, then I discovered sort of the um, covenant creation type viewpoint where, um, you know, the start of the story may not possibly be about all mankind, but rather. Um, it could be just sort of a starting point of Israel's history where, you know, these Jews writing in Babylonian captivity would have began their history. In other words, their their story with the law, how they came under it. And it didn't necessarily have to even be true at that point. I was starting to think, like, maybe this isn't really true. Maybe it's more symbolic. Who knows? Right. Right. Um, but that covenant creation sort of mindset 
shifted me into, um, you know, where, where I am today, which is basically Israel only. And, and the Bible just doesn't pertain to us. Um, as you, you would probably agree. <laughs> oh, totally agree. Yeah. I think, it's, uh, pretty cool that you came from a covenant creation perspective. Um, uh, I heard a couple of guys was like, there's no way he could have done that because right. they, I, they, they see covenant creation as a way to keep yourself in the game. Right. But if you, start seeing the beginning is about Israel in some type of way, yep. it kind of limits who the rest of the Bible is about. Exactly. Yep. It really shuts everybody else out. For but sure. I like how you said uh, the uh, inconsistent preterists, they try to continue things beyond the end. And Correct. you do a lot of good teachings on that. I remember you did one called, if the end has come, how do you fit in? Right. That was, that was pretty good. Because there's nothing really beyond the end to continue. If you're trying to be saved from a judgment that's passed, that don't really make sense. Exactly. And, and to, to add to that, you know, you, you look at the Bible and you look at, um, you know, Israel's history in that old covenant, right, which was supposedly far uh, inferior to the covenant that we're in today, right? And right. you, you have the, this divine revelation nonstop. You have God walking with his covenant people, guiding them, instructing them, you know, bringing forth amazing miracles right before their eyes to show and to, to declare that he is with them. Right. And, you know, and, and all this revelation and you got the oracles of God being given to them. You have prophets coming to them and instructing them as to how they should live and what they should be doing. And that just kind of came to a screeching halt <laughs> Uh, when, yeah. when the temple fell, right? I mean, it, it, we have this supposed new and better covenant, yet this new and better covenant has absolutely no instruction at all what anyone should be doing. You know, everybody's just kind of relying on old antiquated letters written to dead people um, about what they should be doing. And they're, they're, they're obviously uh, in total disagreement and nobody, uh, nobody can agree and, and on, you know, two points. So I think that fact alone really cements the, the case for Israel only. If God was really, um, you know, doing something salvifically today in this new and better covenant, then I think that he'd be a lot more involved than he is today. Oh, yes. A lot more involved and a lot more clear on just what we're supposed to be doing today. Exactly. All right. Well, we're going to jump into some of these questions I have for you. <clears throat> okay. The first one I would like to ask you is, what was the one crucial factor or the main thing that caused you to consider that the death of Christ had nothing to do with you? Uh, that's a good question. Well, there's, there's a lot that can be said there, and, and um, I'll probably run through a few different passages. But the uh, the main shift or the shift started for me when I, I saw the uh, overwhelming proof that God had only given his laws to his covenant people. Um, and, and, you know, the passages that say he did not declare them to anyone but them. Um, that was really the, the one thing that kind of caught my eye, because, you know, if you look in places like Galatians 3, for example, in verse 10, Paul says uh, he's speaking of the law uh, and he says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Right. So I'm looking at that and I'm saying I'm saying, all right. So there's obviously a curse that that is being dealt with here by the death of Christ. And mm -hmm. Paul is actually telling you flat out there that. Those who are under the law, those are the ones that are under the curse, right? So it's it's an exclusive group there. Um, and then he says, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of law. So now I'm like, OK, so this is actually is even more exclusive. It goes right down to the things written in the book of law. Right. And so I'm, look, I'm thinking about all these outside nations and how they absolutely had no clue about the book of law because it was only Israel's book of law. And then, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking at these passages and it goes on. It says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. So, again, Christ redeemed the, those people from the curse of the law. So if God only gave his law to the covenant people and if Christ redeemed these people from the curse of the law, then who are these people? They're obviously Israelites. Right. Um, and that kind of ties in with Matthew 16, uh, 27 and 28, where Jesus looks at the people and he, uh, he says, you know, um, I will come and judge each one of you according to works. Truly, I say to you, some standing here shall not taste death before the Son of Man comes. 
So he's going to come and judge them according to works. And Paul said in Galatians 3 that um, cursed is everyone who doesn't continue to do all things written in the book of law. So what, what really started to happen for me in this shift was I started to take a closer look at the Old Testament. I think a lot of Christians really focus on the New Testament without putting enough emphasis on the Old. Um, right. And I could see in the Old Testament places like Joshua chapter 1 where um, God is commanding Joshua like how to deal with the people of Israel. And he says, um, you know, be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. And then he says, this book of law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. So we have the, the, the book of law being given to the people of Israel alone, and Joshua's commanding them, just like Moses commanded them, that they need to really take this seriously, you know? Um, and then in, in Galatians, you have Paul sort of saying that, yes, this is a curse. You guys are under a curse because it's burden, it's bondage, it's, it's tough to observe. But, um, you know, and he says, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do all things which are written in the book of law. So it's really Israel exclusive if you look at it that way. Um, and then you, you see things like Paul saying Jesus was the end of the law to those who believe. So clearly, if he's the end of the law to those who believe, and if only Israel had the law, then only Israel could believe <laughs> based upon the context. Right. Um, right. And, and then Paul says he was born into the law to redeem those under the law. I mean, again, these are exclusive statements. But what really kind of solidified it for me. Well, two points. One was what we spoke about just prior, the judgment, right? If the judgment is passed, uh, and if the only final judgment that the New Testament speaks of took place at the end of Israel's days and at the end of their law history, then that settles it for me because the, the salvation was from the judgment, right? And right. if that judgment is 2,000 years behind us and that judgment didn't take place at the end of humanity's days, but rather at the end of Israel's days, then that shows you exactly who needed salvation. And then uh, the final thing really was this connection back to Adam. Um, you know, people have a lot to say about Adam. They like to kind of, you know, try to combat Israel only by saying, oh, yeah, well, what about Adam? It goes way back to Adam. It's all about Adam. Um, and, you know, that, that it's really frustrating. I think you had mentioned this before that, you know, it's frustrating because they're not seeing the conclusion of the story. Um, right. The, the conclusion of this story when, at the coming of the Lord shows that there's no more curse. Right. Revelation chapter 22, I believe it is. Yeah. Um, so the curse of Adam was completely done away with, ironically, when the law went away. <laughs> um, but Paul in Romans chapter seven is speaking of the law and he, and he says, um, therefore, my brethren, you have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another. And then he says, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Right. So that sort of ties back to Adam, um, where you see Adam dying by way of the law. Right. I believe the tree of knowledge of good and evil represents the law. Um, you have this tree that gave knowledge of what was good and what was bad, according to God. And you have the, uh, the, comm the commandment coming not to partake of it. It's, of course, there's some symbolism there. I haven't quite figured it all out yet. But, you know, Paul says that the, um, the law gave knowledge of sin and it, it brought the death and condemnation. So that tree to me, that tree of knowledge um, is, is the law. It, it showed them what was good and what was bad. And Paul in Romans 7 Verse uh, seven and four, he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. So uh, Paul is basically saying that they wouldn't even have known of transgression and sin and violation except through the law, because without a law to set the standard, there's really you really don't have any clue. Right. Right. Um, and, and he says, uh, I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. Then he goes on, he says, but sin took opportunity by the commandment, producing in me all manner, manner of evil for apart from the law, sin was dead. And then he and then I believe he starts speaking in the person of Adam. And this is exactly what took place in the garden. If you think about it, he says in verse nine, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin lived and I died. And right. the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. 
He says, sin took opportunity by the commandment, deceived him and killed him. Right. And that's exactly what took place in the garden. You have Adam alive, naked and unashamed. Right. Obviously, this doesn't mean he was walking around with his twig and berries out. Um, it, it means it means that he was he was totally unaware or totally you know guilt free. He he had no clue. His eyes were closed. Clearly, they weren't sewn shut. He just had no knowledge of sin. Right. Like Paul right. said two chapters prior, he said sin was in the world before the law, but wasn't imputed. So that's the picture of Adam before that commandment came. He's walking uh, in perfect harmony with God. He's naked and unashamed. His eyes are closed. He's in, you know, there's no, there's no transgression. There's no violation. But once that law came, like Paul said here, that when the commandment came, sin lived and took opportunity by that commandment and brought the death. And he actually says it deceived him, which I find is kind of ironic because you have the serpent kind of deceiving them by way yeah. of the law, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a ton of connections there in, in Romans 7 that really solidified it for me that, um, you know, Adam represents the law in some way, shape or form, however much sim symbolism is there. That story to me is the law. It's it's uh, it's bringing forth condemnation and death. And like in second Corinthians three, sorry, I, I can kind of get to rambling sometimes. Um, oh, you're good. <laughs> but uh, in second Corinthians chapter three, Paul is speaking of the glory of the new covenant. And he says, uh, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stone, so right away, he calls the law, the ministry of death, right? Key word there is death. Well, what happened to Adam in the garden, right? He died. So so the death that Adam experienced, in my opinion, came by way of the law, the law being given and transgressed. Uh, he says, and that law was written and engraved on stones and it was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look at Moses, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, for if the ministry of condemnation had glory, that's be, that's the law, then the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Right. So he's, he's basically saying that the law was death and condemnation right there, flat out, right? The law brought death and the law brought condemnation. And it, what's the passage for there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So right. Christ <clears throat> yet did away with the condemnation and, and death that the law brought. He was, he, he came for those under the law, just like Paul said. So, so it all kind of ties in perfectly with, with, with that. And um, like I said, Revelation 21, I believe it is, or maybe 22, I have it right here. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the final picture is that there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it and his servants, the 144 K shall serve him and they shall see his face and his name shall be on their forehead. There shall be no night there. Right. And that, that is just perfect because there's no tree of knowledge anymore there. There's no law there. Right. You notice the only thing that that remains there is the tree of life. The tree of knowledge, the law is gone. And I, I think that just kind of comes full circle from the death of Adam representing the law to there being no more law at the end. Uh, that is that is well tied together. So. So the cross, the effects of the cross that it had for uh, it, it related to sins and the curse that was all under the law. And that's something only Israel had. So that pretty much closed the deal for you when it came to seeing the death of Christ had nothing to do with you. It, exactly. I mean, it, you know, and, and there's always that passage that loomed over my head in Matthew 15, 24, where right from the words of Christ, he said, I come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, I, 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 I look at that and I'm like, what's the point, dude? Like, why say that? You know, um, you know, you got you got Christ who supposedly died for everybody, loves everybody the same, blah, blah, blah. And here he is. And he's making a bold statement that, you know, any loving parent would never make they would never you know have two children and ex and say that they love one more than the other right it's just it just doesn't make any sense but yet here is christ saying that he comes only for the lost sheep of the house of israel and when you go back to the old testament at the start you see how much god favored and loved israel above all people so it just makes perfect sense that throughout this story god entrusts this law which was a curse but he entrusts this law to this very exclusive group of people. And at the end of the story, he sends a savior for that same very exclusive group of people as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think Matthew chapter 15, verse 24 is a coffin in the nail for anyone that would try to include themselves 
with the ministry or the purpose of Christ, which he came exactly. to fulfill. And I think the beauty of the entire Bible is we have the book of Revelation, which is the final scene of everything. Yep. And so uh, <laughs> if you ever want to know how the story ends, just just go there. Look at the 12 tribes that are sealed from all, all the nations. Right. Uh, like you were saying in that passage, old things were passed away. Uh, of course, that's talking about the law being done away with. There's no more death. There's no more curse. Right. All those things are fulfilled, complete and done away with. And you don't yeah. have the tree of knowledge of good and evil no more in the garden. Christ right. restored the paradise that was in the very beginning with Adam. And yep. if Adam is simply a story of Israel receiving the law and, you know, showing their transgressions against that law and being cast out of their land to die, yes. then that limits who Christ is actually working with and who he came for. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and I think, yeah. And, and the words of Christ, right. And the words of the apostles and the words of Paul, they all back that up. So eventually what happened for me is I'm, I, I, I'm starting to see, all right, the law is only for Israel. Those who are under the law are the only ones under the curse. Then I'm seeing Jesus's words that he only came for Israel. Then I'm seeing, you know, Peter's words that he came to give repentance and salvation to Israel. Then I'm seeing Paul's words that uh, he died for those under the law. And it's all just kind of piling and piling and piling up until finally I'm like, I can't deny this. This is crystal clear to me. You know, like th this, he only came for Israel, you know, just like he said. And, and then, you know, the rest is history. Everything kind of clicks. So uh, but it's been a it's been a good journey into clarity. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm thankful that I saw it and didn't you know, waste more time under the deception of thinking that I'm actually doing something in some imaginary way or in some imaginary kingdom today. <laughs> right. You're just following the evidence, the scriptural, logical evidence. That it right. And, it, and if and if you know what, like like I always tell people, I say, you know what? If God is going to judge me one day for following where the evidence leads, then I'm OK with that because I'm I'm being totally honest with the scriptures. I'm not forcing myself in. I'm going where they lead and I'm letting them say what they say. And if that's not being totally honest and genuine and organic, then I don't know what is. And I'm I'm OK with that. You know, right. Right. All right. Well, uh, we'll move on to the uh, second question I have for you. OK. And it goes like this. How can someone quickly and easily understand that the promise of the Holy Spirit was only for Israel? So that's uh, that's another good question. Um, so basically what I do is I have like a, a set of scriptures that I kind of like to take people to 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 address certain things. And um, and I've been, of course, defending this for a while against a lot of haters. So they kind of pop into my head pretty quickly. But. <laughs> um, what I, what I'll do is I usually go, I start out in Joel chapter two, where Joel is predicting, you know, in the, the end times where God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, but he qualifies that all flesh. And he says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men and your young men shall see visions. Um, and I will pour out my spirit in those days. And then he says, and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, blood, fire, pillars, blah, blah, blah. And before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance, as the Lord had said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So, again, the qualification of the salvation there is a Israel, and it's also only among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Now, you look at the word remnant there and, and you see it all over the New Testament as well, that it was a remnant that was being saved. And yet you have almost three billion so-called Christians today. I mean, that's not a remnant. That's the whole world. Right. Um, right. So something, something's not adding up. But um, so Joel predicts that the spirit's going to be poured out on Israel in the last days um, and among the remnant whom the Lord would call. Then when we go to the New Testament and we're in the last days, we look at Acts chapter two, where the Holy Spirit's coming. Um, and Peter is, you know, speaking and he tells these people, he says, men and, and brethren, let this be known to you for these men are not drunk uh, since it's only the third hour. But this Holy Spirit that's being poured out, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And then he, of course, quotes what I just read to you back from Joel. Um, and then he, he says, you know, men of Israel, hear these words. This is Jesus. He uh, he was delivered for you and raised up, blah, blah, blah. He talks about the patriarch David. So he's still all focused on Israel's history. But the key to take note of is down in 
verse 36 that it says therefore let all the house of israel know assuredly that god has made this jesus whom you crucified both lord and christ so peter is saying let all the house of israel know and then if you look in in verse 37 they ask they say well what shall we do right and peter answers and says repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of jesus for the remission of sins and you still speaking to israel shall receive the gift of the holy spirit so right there Peter tells you again who's getting the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking to the men of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. And then he, he says in verse 39, he says, For the promise, what promise? For the promise of the Holy Spirit and promise of salvation is to you, Israel, he says, and to your children, still Israel, and to <clears throat> all who are afar off, as many as our Lord will call. So it never shifts off of Israel there. It, it's going to Israel near and Israel afar off, as many as the Lord, our God, he says, will call. So that's a very crucial portion to take note of um, that really shows that Peter already knew that there were Israelites near and Israelites afar off, right? Right, um, right. And then if we go to Ephesians 2, this is one, this is a place where I really like to, to you know, talk about because people look at this passage and they think that it's really speaking of pagans, right? In, in verse 11 of Ephesians 2, he says, Paul says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. So what is Paul saying there? Is he saying that um, these people, that these saints that he's writing to were once pagan in their meat suit, and then when they believed in Jesus, they, they got rid of that meat suit and became Israelite in their meat suit? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. What he's actually saying is, therefore, remember that you, once uncircumcised, right, who is called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh, those being the Jews. He says that at that time you were without Christ being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God. But now, this is where it ties into Acts chapter two. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So Paul is out here in the nations doing the work that Peter predicted that God would call those afar off from Israel back to the fold. And this ties in with what Jesus says in John, where he says, um, you know, he's speaking to the Jews and he says, uh, I have sheep that are not of this fold. In other words, I have Israelites that are not of the circumcision party. And so anyways, in verse 14 of Ephesians 2, he says, he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is, the laws of commandments contained in ordinances. So why would God have to abolish commandments contained in ordinances, a.k.a. the book of law, for true pagans, right? They never had the book of law. They had no clue about the book of law. Right. So, so Paul is telling them that, hey, you're uncircumcised. You're living out in the nations. You're dead in that trespass, just like he told the Colossians. You're dead in the trespass of being uncircumcised because these are Israelites. They're supposed to be circumcised. All right. And so they're, they're dead in the trespass of being circumcised. And Christ had abolished that law in his flesh for them to create one new man from the two. A perfect picture of the prodigal son, um, which, you know, is out in the nations rolling around with pagan filth. And he comes back to the fold. <clears throat> exactly what it's all about. Exactly. Um, you know, and then um, obviously the ceiling, like you just mentioned in Revelation 7, was only for Israel. You know, we see in Revelation 7, verse 1 to 8, that uh, the, the angels are going around sealing the elect on the forehead, right? And he, and he hears the number. It's 144,000, and he tells you where they're from, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. It says nothing about pagans, says nothing about anybody else but them. Um, and then it gives you the list, 12,000 from each tribe. So, um, and of course, Revelation 14 says that only the 12 tribes could learn the salvation song, which, I mean, that's a smack in the face. How could you get around that? Um, you know, and then you have Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, which is just sort of like a border patrol passage that I like to reference that says, you know, the, the promise was until, um, let me see if I can get there real quick. I had it pulled here in him. You also trusted after you, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's Jacob. The purchased possession is Jacob. He was given to God at the end. The kingdom was Jacob, like Luke 1 says, and that kingdom was delivered to God, like 1 Corinthians 15 says, at the end. 
as a possession for God, which, by the way, Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, is always called God's portion, God's inheritance, God's possession. So the Holy Spirit was a promise that was a deposit, if you will, of their inheritance until they received their inheritance, right? Until God received them as his chosen people, as his elect at the end. So it's pretty easy once you look at the, you know, the full scope of passages to see that the Holy Spirit was only for Israel. All Israel received it by the end. And that kingdom um, was delivered to God. And that's when the Holy Spirit was sort of done away with, if you will, because it was only for that purpose. Very good. And I think uh, another passage that makes it like really clear who the Holy yep. Spirit was. For, of course, it was a promise. But if you go to, I think it's um, Romans chapter nine, verses four. You know, yep. Paul makes it clear that the promises pertain to Israel. And of course, the yeah. outpouring of the Holy Spirit was a promise. Yep. And so you have a bunch of uh, verses, you know, that just point you in that direction to show you that Israel is in focus here when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would come. I love how you connect that together, dude. Awesome stuff. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Now, you mentioned Revelation chapter seven. And I want to yeah. ask you, because Christians really rely on a great multitude from all nations in Revelation 7, they try to apply that to themselves to keep right. themselves in the game almost when you're sharing this stuff with them. Right. And I remember I was watching TV in one night. I think it was Tim LaHaye. But he made the point that the 144,000, he was trying to make a distinction between the two groups, the great multitude and then the 144,000. He said the 144,000 were actually uh, like witnesses. And they are the ones that create this great multitude in heaven. They, that's where the great multitude comes from. So yeah. can you explain, you know, in your view on who that group is and why it doesn't pertain to people today? Sure. Yeah. So this this was something that really kind of um, hit home for me when I started to see it, uh, you know, because all throughout my former Christian days, people would say, like you just said, that these are two different groups. You have the 144K, uh, which is obviously Israel. No one would deny that. But then you have this great multitude that comes in from all the nations, right? Um, and so the Revelation 7, well, I'll just read it real real quick. I'm not going to read it all, but I'll give you the gist. So the first eight verses, you see, like I just said, that these elect ones are being sealed on the forehead. Um, and you have them being revealed as to who they are. They're the 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel. So it, it, it sort of struck me as kind of odd, if you will, that only the 12 tribes are mentioned as having received that sealing of the Holy Spirit, right? Like, what's the point, right? Another another question, what's the point? Like, why would, uh, why would Revelation go above and beyond to say that only they, or to only mention them in the sealing, right? Weren't true pagans in the nations really getting that sealing? I mean, after all, this is, you know, the Holy Spirit we're talking about here. And so that kind of like got my, my attention on it. And then I'm looking at verse nine forward in the same chapter, and I'm I'm saying to myself, this is a picture of them in heaven, right? This is a picture of a group of people um, having received their promise, standing in heaven. It says this. It says, after these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed with white, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne into the lamb and all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. So this is a celebratory scene in heaven where they're all around the throne and they're all worshiping and they're crying this new song and they're saying salvation belongs to our God and they're singing this new song. And, and it's just this joyful time. Right. And then, um, <laughs> And so I'm, I'm wondering to myself, I'm saying, well, if only the 12 tribes received the Holy Spirit, then where'd they go? Right. How come how come this is only the great multitude from all nations standing in heaven, having received that final promise? Where are the 12 tribes? Did they just not make it? Did God leave them somewhere? Like what's going on here? So as I go f forward in that, I see that one of the elders answers and asks them, who are these ones arrayed in white, white robes and where do they come from? And he said to them. These are the ones who come out from the great tribulation and they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So obviously we know when the great tribulation was right. It was the final right. period of time. Jesus even told them that on the Mount of Olives that you're going to go through much tribulation. You're going to be hated for my namesake. But he who endures through the end will be saved. 
right? And then you have this um, Paul saying, I think it's Paul or Peter saying in Acts, through much tribulation, we, we, the saints, will enter the kingdom of God. So you have these ones in all the nations, everywhere they are, going through this tribulation period, persevering and pressing on and looking and waiting and wondering when the coming of the Lord was going to occur for them. And so this great multitude came out from that last day's great tribulation period, which, by the way, was at hand because everything written in this book was at hand. So you have this great multitude coming out from the great tribulation period. And if that's 2000 years behind us and this is not in our future, then that means this great multitude has nothing to do with you or I today. It had everything to do with the saints who are being plucked out and fished out from that last day's era. OK, and then going back to what I said. You look at this and you say, where did the 12 tribes go? Well, what happens here is in the beginning, John hears the number. He hears the 144,000. And I believe in verse 9, we, we get another look at the same group. But this time, John looks and behold, he sees a great multitude of all, na of all nations, right, that no one could number. Well, ironically, back in Hosea, uh, when he's making his predictions and whatnot, he refers to the children of Israel as being you know, numerous and a great number that could not be numbered. Right. right. So you you and and lest we forget, we have this promise that in Abraham's seed, that being in his descendants, many peoples or many nations would be blessed. Right. So um, it's all kind of coming together here. And I'm starting to see that this great multitude from all nations is actually the 12 tribes of Israel being gathered in from all the nations where they were in that urgent last days, temporary gospel. Right. Yep. And that that matches what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14. He said this gospel will go to all nations and then the end will come. Now, full preterists hate that passage and they do everything they can to get out from under it. But that says what it says. It says that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached to all the nations and then the end would come. So if all the nations already got the gospel by the end, then what nations are getting the gospel today? It just doesn't make sense. Of course, we have the passages that say all Israel would be saved by the coming of the Lord. And that included the fullness of the ones out in the nations. That's Romans 11. So it all ties in nicely there. But Re Revelation chapter five really shows that the great multitude was actually those who were plucked out from uh, every nation, tribe, tongue and kindred. It wasn't every nation, tribe, tongue and kindred. It was those plucked out from every nation, tribe, tongue and kindred, which, of course, ties in. Um, I think it's verse uh, eight it says now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Ready out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the land. So the focus here is that these ones were singing this song, right? Which, by the way, Revelation 14 says only the 144,000 could learn. That's the 12 tribes of Israel. And here they right. are singing the redemption song, saying that, they, that God had redeemed them out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So that ties back to Revelation 7. And when John looks and sees this great multitude out of every nation, tribe, tongue, and kindred. It's obviously the same group. It's the 144,000 of the 12 tribes. And that makes sense because they were the only ones sealed with the Holy Spirit. And they were also the only ones who received the promise, um, which is confirmed also in Revelation 21, where we see only the 12 tribes' names were written on that new city. That is pretty clear, Jason. <laughs> you can't really get around that at all. Um, no. 44,000 are the only ones that can learn this redemption song right. and is also limits who these people are the uh, the time of the tribulation you right. take that into account it's very limited who it can apply to it can't apply to people today because jesus was pretty clear that that tribulation would happen in that very generation that he lived and died in exactly and and anything else Anything, any other speculation beyond that is totally unsubstantiated, right? So you could say, right. oh, yeah, you know, there's tribulation going on in the world, like a Christian just died somewhere. But that that is total speculation, and it's not in the text at all. Everything that's in the text was going to take place in that generation and before some standing there died. And that's why we have this collection of letters and epistles that was written 
to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, like James wrote to. He actually addresses it. He says, James to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. That's because the, the, the ones who are being gathered in were the elect from all nations, you know, scattered abroad. And, you know, th there's, there's like people that argue that. They're like, yeah, well, James only wrote to the Jews, right? Well, no, James didn't only write to the Jews. James wrote to the 12 tribes of Israel scattered abroad. Yeah, I think the uh, when you look at who these letters are addressed to, that's another nail in the coffin. As a right. Christian, I never looked at who the letters was addressed to. I'm just reading this stuff, you know, and applying it to myself, hearing the pastor preach over on the, these things throughout the service. But we never acknowledge who these letters was written to. And James is pretty clear when he says to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, how do you read yourself into the stuff that's being said there? I know, right? It just crazy. makes no sense. Makes crazy. no sense at all. Peter but that's as well, right? Peter, Peter oh, uh, opens yeah. up his letter to the elect of the dispersion. That's the dispersed Israelites out in all the nations. Um, and then, you know, the other thing, too, that people aren't really, they don't really think critically enough about is this book of Revelation, right? The book of Revelation is going, the, the letter is going to foreign nations, right? It's going to the seven churches of Asia. Oh, and, yeah. and you have this book that's just chock full of Jewish genre and Old Testament references and everything. So it makes no sense. Why would John be writing to pagans who never knew anything about the Old Testament? And why would he include just reference after reference after reference of things that only Jews and Israelites would be familiar with? That's and right. It, just, it doesn't make any sense. Right. They say the book of Revelation has the most um, Hebraic background out of all the books in the New Testament because he's exactly. pulling from like Daniel from Ezekiel, a lot of the concepts that they use, he's taking those concepts and placing them inside the book of Revelation. Exactly. And, and and I like how you said that concepts, because I see like way too many people make this mistake. Like what they, they do is they, for instance, they'll look back at Isaiah 65 and 66, like Don Preston's guilty of this all the time. And they look at that portion and they say, oh, this is pertaining to us today, right? This is us today. But Isaiah 65 and 66 in its purest original context is not about 8070. It's about the return to Zion Second Temple period, because you, you see that these Israelites were coming back. God was creating a new heaven and a new earth. They were going to come back to the land. Jerusalem was going to be a joy again. They would rebuild the cities. They would rebuild the temple. They would plant vineyards, eat the fruit. There'd be children singing in the streets. Their offspring would be blessed again in the land of Jerusalem. Um, they would, uh, God would reestablish the law. He would take some of them again for priests and Levites. They would come again for the Sabbaths and new moons. This is all about the law being back in the land and God doing something new. So the, when the, 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 Book of Revelation uses the same terminology, like John sees a new heaven, new earth. Yes, he's using the same concepts found back in the Old Testament, that being the same terminology. And he's he's sort of, um, you know, he's making a point that God is doing something new, but he's not taking everything that Isaiah said in 65 and 66 and saying, hey, this is happening right now. Because, exactly. you know, because the law passed away in 8070. If, if Don could show me one proof that any of that took place in 8070, the temple was rebuilt, the cities were rebuilt, the desolate places rebuilt, the people coming back to the land, planting vineyards, none of that, right? He would have to spiritualize all of that, and actually he does, he um, does. Which, is, which is wacky, man, but yeah, good, good call on the concepts, because that's really what it is in the New Testament. Well, I'm pretty sure Tim LaHaye would hate to hear what you just said concerning the 100... <laughs> For a thousand <laughs> yeah, and the great will. multitude. <laughs> maybe I should try to go on the show. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should try that. <laughs> yeah, get thrown off. All right. Well, let's get to this. Is this is one I really like? I really like this question I'm about to ask. She says people really hate the fact that the saints were called up to heaven at the end. Right. Uh, so, can you give us a like brief rundown of how you believe that all played out at the end? And also, mm -hmm. offer us some thoughts on how people contradict themselves. When they believe in the ascension of Jesus, but reject the rapture of the saints. Yeah, definitely. That, that's a good question. And, and it's one that I like to kind of elaborate on. So I'll try to be brief. But um, I know it's two one, but I think you can handle it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I first believed this, too, when I came into Christianity, like, you know, what, eight years ago, I, I believed in a rapture. I um, thought that I was going to get sucked up out of the planet. I thought that, you know, Jesus was coming for me. Then when I came around to full preterism, 
I had to reject it because I saw the implications of, you know, what that actually could mean, right? If everything was fulfilled in 8070, then obviously if I want to partake of this story, I have to find some something else to do with that whole concept. I can't take it literally because it just sort of ends the story. And ironically, I found that there was a group of preterists, uh, Ed Stevens in his camp, that believes that they were taken away in 8070, but somehow salvation continued beyond that. That's just mind blowing. Um, but uh, when you really look at the story, that's actually precisely what it says. Jesus was the prototype. That This is important to take note of. Jesus was the prototype. He was the firstborn of the brethren, as Paul called him. He died. He rose. He walked out of the tomb. His body was not left in the tomb, right? Acts chapter 2 says very plainly that his body did not see corruption, right? In other words, if, you, if they went back to that tomb, his body, Jesus' fleshly body, was not in that tomb. It was nowhere to be found. And he walked out of the tomb, and in Acts chapter 1, he ascended up into heaven in his glorified new immortal body that came out of the tomb. All right, now if you uh, try to reject the ascension of Jesus, like some have tried to do when they see what it does, um, which is a, a new thing, by the way. Mo pretty much everybody I've ever met always believes in a literal ascension of the God-man Jesus, right? Right. But, the, but, you know, lately there's been a few people who have actually— tried to do away with that and say that, no, no, that's just symbolic and everything, right? But really? the point is, is if, if, if you reject the ascension, then you need to tell us where he went, right? Yeah. Because his body is nowhere to be found. You, he's not seen again. After the ascension, Jesus in bodily form is not seen again. So where did he go? So the point here is that Jesus sets the expectation for the saints of what their existence would be like in the age to come. If we look at Luke chapter 20 and verse 34, the Sadducees are asking him about the resurrection. And he, he asked them, therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife does this lady become? For all seven had her as a wife. And Jesus answers them and says, the sons of this age, this current age that we're in, marry and are given in marriage. Then he says, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age, the age to come, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they even die anymore, for they're equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So Jesus, they ask him, like, yo, whose wife is this girl going to be, right? And Jesus says, they don't even marry there, dude. <laughs> you know, like, like he, these, these guys like Preston like to, to refer back to this Leverite marriage law as if that's what Jesus is talking about. No. The Leverite marriage law was on the mind of the Sadducees. Jesus yeah. answers and shoots that thought down completely and just nips it right in the bud and says, that's irrelevant because they don't even marry there, right? Um, and what he says is he says, those who are counted worthy to attain that age don't marry, nor can they die anymore. And the reason they don't marry and can't die is because they're like angels in heaven, okay? And, and then, uh, so Jesus tells his audience what to expect in the age to come and notice the age to come was not for everybody like these guys have a tendency to say that we're in this age to come today and anyone can come in but no jesus doesn't say that he says those who are counted worthy to attain that age in other words you had to be counted worthy you had to meet the qualification you had to to to, to um, receive some sort of uh qualification in order to inherit that age and that qualification was obviously the mark of the holy spirit but the point is, again, is that people are 0 for 3 today. Ask Don yeah. Preston, are you married? He's married. Jesus said you wouldn't be married in the age to come. Ask Don Preston if he'll die today. Yeah, he's going to die today at some point. So he's 0 for 2. And ask Don Preston if he's like an angel in heaven today. He might say yes, but obviously we know he's not. So he's 0 for 3 in terms of the qualifications and the signs that would accompany being in that age to come. We're all 0 for 3, right? right. So uh, so that just really speaks volumes there. But Jesus told his saints he was going to prepare a place for them. People put so much stock into the one passage where Jesus says that the kingdom is within them. I mean, it's like they build a whole doctrine on it. But you notice it's nowhere else. It's nowhere else to be found. Right. But right. that concept <clears throat> makes no sense when held up against all the other proof in the Bible. Did Jesus go away to prepare a place for them within themselves? Uh, when someone enters the kingdom today, do they enter into themselves, right? Are people out in the streets today preaching a message saying, hey, come into the kingdom, man. It's really cool. The waters are great. And then somebody says, all right, well, where is it? How do I do it? And they say, just come into yourself, man. 
You know, <laughs> this, this yeah. is what I'm, you know, this is what I'm talking about. It's just super dumb and people don't think critically enough about it to, to, to realize, you know, the implications of that view. The truth is that there was a real expectation for these saints that they'd be like him and go where he was when he came for them. Uh, in first Corinthians chapter 15, there's a lot to be said on this. I'm not going to read it all, but, um, note some of what Paul says here. Okay. So he's going through and he says, he's speaking of the order of the resurrection. He says, but each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, that's Christ raising from the dead and ascending into heaven. And afterwards, those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the father, that's the purchased possession. That's Jacob. Luke one says the kingdom was Jacob and Jacob would stand forever. So he's delivering Jacob to God, the father. That's why all Israel had to be saved. But note that all who are Christ are raised at his coming and then comes the end. So if all who are Christ were raised at his coming and his coming's 2000 years ago, then nobody is Christ today. Right. It sounds harsh, but it's just the plain truth. Um, and then you as he goes on down in verse 35. He says, but some will say, how are the dead raised and with what body do they come? And he says, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive until it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. Now, this is important because people inconsistent full prets like to say that this this flesh and this body is speaking of the old covenant. Right. But this makes no sense. Paul in verse 39 starts speaking of flesh types, literal fleshly body types. He says, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another flesh of fish, and another flesh of birds, right? So obviously he's talking about literal body types. He's not talking about the old covenant, right? And then yeah. in verse 40, he goes on, he says, there are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. So now he's comparing the heavenly body of Christ to the earthly body of Adam. He says, there is one glory of the sun, another of the moon. He goes on. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Now he's not talking about the old covenant because he had just got done outlining all these different flesh types. And his very previous thought to that was that there's heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, angelic bodies and earthly bodies. So he says the earthly body is sown in corruption, right? And that, and then he says it is raised in incorruption. He says it's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown in a natural body and it's raised in a spiritual one. There's a natural and there's a spiritual. And so it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So again, he's talking about Adam, the man of dust, and he's saying that Adam was created mortal. He was a corruptible mortal being. Christ was incorruptible. He was immortal, right? So right. The, the point here that I'm trying to make is that this has nothing to do with the old covenant and it has everything to do with the body type that they were going to inherit at his coming. They were going to inherit the same body type that the prototype, Jesus himself, inherited when he rose from the tomb and he ascended on high into heaven. Paul says in verse 50, he says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's just a bold statement because everybody today, you, me, my grandmother, everybody, we're all flesh and blood, right? Yet all these Christians say they're in the kingdom of God. So they go directly against what Paul says, where he says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. He says, nor does corruption inherit corruption. But behold, I tell you a mystery that we shall not all sleep. In other words, we shall not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible body must put on incorruption and this mortal body must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shell that we're living in has put on incorruption and this mortal dust body has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying death is swallowed up in victory. So it was at that point when they would be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, that's the coming of the Lord that they would put on that immortal shell, that immortal glorified body, whatever it looked like, whatever it was, God only knows, but they would put that same body that the prototype put on and they would experience the same reality, right? And, and look what Paul told the Thessalonians. He says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, so same thing he said to the, the Corinthians, those who you know remain to his coming, he said, will by no means precede those who are asleep. 
meaning the dead ones. He said, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So the same exact reality was being set, or same exact expectation was being set for the saints. Christ ascended up into the clouds, the saints were told they too would ascend up into the clouds. And it makes perfect sense because Christ was the firstborn of the brethren. He was the prototype. All right. This is where the inconsistent full preterist position really falls apart badly. Paul explains the exact same sequence of events for those who remained until his coming. They'd follow the pattern of Christ. They would be changed mm -hmm. to immortal. They would ascend up into the clouds like he did. They would be glorified and they would never die anymore because now they'd be like angels in heaven because that's where they were going. So if you believe these things and, and, and if you believe that these things literally happened to the God man Jesus in Acts chapter one, then automatically you trap yourself. Uh, it's yeah. very inconsistent to reject the same events for the rest of the brethren that is coming. Um, and, you know, John says much of the same. He says, you know, that, that at that point, they didn't know yet what they would be like. But when he appeared for them, then they would know. And he says that they would be like him. Well, how was he? He was immortal. He was glorified. He was an angelic heavenly man, right? And so that was the whole thing, right? And of course, this doesn't sit well for many people. Um, it, it didn't sit well with me either because it, it seems to, um, you know, quickly eliminate people. But the, the, the truth is, is that you got to go where the text leads. You got to go with what it says. And like I said earlier, God is not going to punish people for taking what it says at face value. Um, you know, the, um, you know, th this, this also what it does, I think, for a lot of people, myself included, is it, it seems to kind of like push the Bible story or at least the conclusion of it into fairy tale land or, you know, mythology or just plain old mythology, BS, yeah. you know. Yep. Um, and, and even though people take all the other supernatural things literally in the Bible, like manna coming down from heaven and all this stuff, um, you know, they, they reject this because they think it's a little too far fetched to believe. But if you really looked at the stack of supernatural material that's included in the book, you really have no place to reject a final glorious ride off into the sunset calling up, do you? You know, um, I, I'd much rather take the story for what it says plainly than to twist it so I can include myself. Could it be total BS? Absolutely. Of course. Um, but if it's not BS and if for some reason or somehow this actually did take place in history um, and if I take it simply for what it says, then I'm like I said, I'm sure God's not going to hate on me for it. Very true. I think a very telling um, sign about the New Testament Gospels is the only place these events are recorded, you know, anything with Jesus is only in the New Testament. You don't have outer sources really that confirm these things. Some exactly. people will argue for Josephus. But I, I mean, I heard a lot of things about Josephus. I looked into Josephus and a lot of those things can't really be taken. Uh, he wasn't an eyewitness of Jesus himself. Right. So anything he's reporting about Jesus is hearsay. Right. Uh, but I think that's a very good point about the resurrection. Uh, I remember coming in as a Christian, you know, just reading the New Testament, you expect it to be physically taken off the land, off the earth into heaven. Yeah. That's exactly. just what you come to from the natural reading, unless you're just reading more into it or you have uh you know you're trying to keep something going you have to change it and that's what i came across with don k preston when i first came into preterism i was watching some of his videos and i seen how he i think he has like a 200 plus lesson on uh first corinthians 15 300 plus oh three <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the yeah, guy yeah, he's dude. doing he's going deep in trying to change the nature of it and yep. trying to explain away all these texts, it took him 300 texts to arrive at a conclusion that you that you wouldn't come to if you was just reading it at face value. Exactly. Yeah. And what you said, like, let's let's average that out at about 12 minutes of video. I got a calculator right here. That's thirty six hundred minutes. Divide that by 60. That's uh, hold on. Let's see. Thirty six hundred minutes divided by 60. 60 hours of material. Don K. Preston just taught for two and a half days straight without <laughs> taking a break. <laughs> and and he, he, he basically just created his own way of reading things that are so very plain that even a toddler could understand them, you know? Uh, yeah. But that's what you have to do. If you want to explain it away, you have to go to great lengths to make it say something that it doesn't. 
Yeah, I think you uh there was a video you made about it. Oh, yeah, the future is get some things right. You remember that one? Yes. Yep. And uh, you were showing how they actually get the resurrection part right because they're expecting a physical uh taking yep. up the things. Exactly. And of course, the preterists reject that. If you're going to do this covenant eschatology, you have right. to reject that or your whole paragraph falls. Absolutely. Completely falls flat on his face. Well, I'm going to get you off here. I got one last question for you. Yeah. And this is something that comes up a lot, especially when you're sharing uh, this entire message with people. Yesterday on Facebook, I was sharing some things with people and they uh, accused me of being an atheist and trying to steal their hope. Right. And uh, so I want to ask you, what would you say to people who accuse you of being an atheist or accuse you of stealing their hope? Sure. Yeah. Um, so personally, I could never be an atheist. You know, um, had I come into Christianity the way every Tom, Dick and Harry does, um, you know, that being just by, you know, family association or tradition or whatever it is with no um, experiential, you know, uh, I guess, uh, proof or whatever. Um, and, and had I stumbled upon IO, I'm sure I'd probably be an atheist by now. In other words, if I didn't have that one moment in time about eight years ago where someone or something took my pain away instantly, um, then, then I'm sure I would probably be an atheist having seen IO and seen, you know, what it is and, and how clear it is and whatnot. And that I can understand where some people can kind of go that route because obviously, you know, there, there have been IOers in the past who have departed off into atheism. Um, and that's fine. I mean, Hey, Look, I don't I don't judge anybody for going anywhere. If that's your view, that's fine. Personally, for me, though, um, I couldn't I couldn't get there just because, you know, I did have that experience. And look, I don't need anybody to believe me. I know there's probably people out there that don't believe me, but I'm I'm a no BS kind of cat. Like I don't I don't sugarcoat things that obviously you can tell. Um, and so when I say something, it's the truth because I actually experienced it. So I'm not going to you know, sit here and tell people that um, some something answered me in my moment of despair and and took my pain away uh, if it didn't really happen. Right. That would make no sense. Why would I do it? Um, so, you know, do I question God? Absolutely. Do I question what the heck he's doing today, if anything at all? Absolutely. I look around and I see good people suffering and dying, getting cancer and being miserable and having to suffer and be tortured. I mean, why? What's the point? You know, even Christians, too. The, the funny thing is, is I watch a ton of Dateline in 2020. It's like my favorite thing. I love murder mysteries. And, uh, you know, almost I would say probably three fourths of the time. So 75 percent of the time that I watch these murder mysteries, the victims are usually Christian. <laughs> they they, yeah. they always they're always Christian. You know, they're, they're the ones who have faith. They're the good people who just, you know, treat people good and go to church on Sunday and then they end up getting shot in the head. Right. It, yep. it just doesn't make any sense, you know, and, and with all this confusion and arguing and discord and bickering back and forth and violence towards Christians, as well as internally within the 40,000 denominations of Christianity, I can say with certainty that there is no Holy Spirit leading and guiding people today. It's just it's just impossible to be uh, guided by this, you know, force that's supposed to lead into all truth and yet still have the levels of confusion and discord that we have today. Um, you know, and, and to be honest, if there was a Holy Spirit, you wouldn't be able to keep people away from the church because there'd be supernatural things going on. There'd be, um, you know, proof of what people claim. But instead, it's just a laughing stock. And, and as we advance in, in knowledge and the age of you know, knowledge and information, you know, we're starting to really see why it's because the story was never about us. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I suppose false hope is better than no hope for, for many people. Uh, but personally, I would rather eliminate the lies first and then pick up the pieces from there. Um, you know, there, there's no sense in acting and role playing as if I'm an ancient Israelite cursed under the law of Yahweh. Um, you know, will I ever know what really happened to me that day? Probably not. But that's enough for me. That That's that's fine. I'm cool with it. I cherish my family, my friends, my loved ones. And whatever lies ahead is out of my control. You know, honestly, even as many wackadoodles that you have. <coughs> excuse me, out there on, you know, YouTube and the internet claiming that they died and went to heaven and came back and all that, you know, whatever exists on the other side of death, that's fine. Um, it, it, it's okay. Nobody really has a clue. And maybe that's the way God truly intended it to be, you know?
Um, so yeah, I would just say I'm not an atheist for those who think I am. And, and, um, I do have hope, um, hope in the, in the sense of, you know, I felt some kind of loving creator or being or whatever it was reach down and touch me that day, but taking that experience and, you know, jamming it into the Bible to make me be part of an ancient Israeli narrative, um, just doesn't sit well with me. I'd rather say, you know what? God is an open book. He's available to anyone. I don't know how, I don't know why, I don't know how he works or what activates his response. Um, but I do know that there is something there that, um, that, that at least cares for people in some capacity. Right. I mean, that, that's about all I can say about it. Um, but I did have one other thing I wanted to mention to you quickly. Go ahead. It, the, there's a, um, there's supposedly this debate coming up between Don Preston and Joel Sexton. Did you hear yeah. about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's going to be interesting to me. Now, obviously, Joel Sexton is like, you know, the drunk version of Popeye the Sailor Man. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I'm not, not, not really concerned with him. But what I want to see is I want to see Don deal <clears throat> with the implication argument of if the judgment is passed, how does anyone need salvation and justification today? And, you know, and, and I'm going to be interested to see how he handles that. And I may even, you know, do my own little response to him on my channel at some point as to, you know, what he's saying and how he's getting there. But if Joel, you know, really had any brain, he would actually look at some of the Israel only material because we're the ones who um, really, you know, smack that view around and say, look, if you're going to say everything is fulfilled, including the final judgment, then there can be no justification beyond that. And that's exactly what we've been saying. So uh, I just hope that Joel, you know, does it due diligence and, and really um, puts the hammer to the nail, you know. Now, I actually uh, talked to Joel. I tried to get him to come on the show to talk about it, but he said he didn't yeah. want anything to do with a person that was a part of Israel only. He said I was a good guy and all, but right. he just didn't want to associate it with that. But he actually has some really good points uh, to show that if you're going to accept full preterism, then Israel only is true. That's what he's right. basically said. He said, if full preterism is true, then Israel only was right all along. He told that right. to Donald Preston. And uh, he sets it up in like a courtroom setting. He says, you got God, the judge, and yep. he's judged by his law. And yep. uh, he goes into Romans where Paul says those he have glorified. I think it's like the whole justification, glorification part. You familiar yep. with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's saying those that are declared justified are those who are going to be exempt from the judgment. All right. right. And if yeah. the judgment is not in the future, who is being justified today? If the judgment has already passed, that means everyone that's going to be justified and glorified already. That already happened. Yep. If the judgment is passed. Yep. And that's that's pretty that's a pretty good analogy he had. And um, I like it. I like I like hearing his thoughts uh, when it comes to that stuff. Of course, he goes right. off the rails when it comes to other things oh yeah and uh he, <laughs> he i mean he makes a bunch of comical videos with him lifting weights and stuff but um, oh yeah and, and you know what's funny too is he uh like I, th what i usually say is like sometimes i check in with these guys like uh just for the sheer comedy like i actually like i travel a lot as you know so like i'll be on planes or in airports and board whatever and i like to like look and listen to some of them just for the laughs of it like steven witset I mean, that oh, guy yeah. is that that's sheer comedy. You know what I mean? Like that's I, that to me, that's better than going to the comedy club and watching a co comedian. Um, <laughs> so 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 I like tuning in every once in a while and watching these guys. But, you know, Joel is the type of guy who's always got a debate set up, but never follows through with it. Right. Like he's yeah. always he's always announcing I'm debating this guy and then it always falls through. But what I've been seeing is like each time that he announces that he's going to debate Don Preston. He usually follows it up with a video of him like falling off the wagon, dropping f bombs, you know, like <laughs> like just smashing beer bottles over his head the night before. And like I think what he tries to do is like he almost tries to pur purposely sabotage the debate, like like saying, "All right, well, I'm I'm gonna debate this guy, but I want to put out a video and uh, and and be vulgar and everything, so that maybe they'll cancel the debate." I don't know. I could yeah. be wrong. But I just like if you look at he, he recently posted one about like when life knocks you down, get the F up or something like and it's just him. <laughs> it's just him like dropping F bobs. It's quite, quite funny. But uh, yeah, you might knows? be on to something I, right there. What's that? You might be on to something right there, because when he yeah. first said he was going to have the debate with Don Preston, 
he recorded a video and he was predicting what Don would do. But he's right. lighting up a joint yes. and talking about, Don, this is for you. <laughs> I know. I saw that. I'm, I'm thinking to myself. What 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 person would do this, right? Like you're supposedly a Christian. You're you're gonna debate another Christian in godly charity and love, right? And here you are, you're lighting up a doobie on on the air, telling this guy that this buds for you. <laughs> <laughs> and he he did the video until he finished, I believe, smoking the entire thing. Yeah, he smoked the whole thing through his head, which was quite impressive. But uh, yeah, I, I'm surprised that uh, Donny Boy has still agreed to the debate. Usually. You know, Don tries to take the out by saying, oh, this isn't this isn't a godly man or, you know, and that could still very well happen. Like, I have a feeling that that may happen before we get there. But uh, but let's hope and let's see if uh, if it really happens, because I'd like to see Don wiggle out of that chokehold that that he's in there. Yeah. And I think if he does turn it down, it'll be very telling, especially with all the people who are leaving full preterism right now, right. Uh, especially with Joe Sexton. There's some other guys, Lance Conley. Yeah. Uh, a bunch of guys, they're leaving full preterism, sh- saying that it's heresy. So right. Don, you know, to, to secure his following, he needs to, like, address it. He didn't address Israel only, which was very no. telling as well. Yeah, yep. And, uh, yeah, he rejected would, Bradley's debate challenge, too. I would love to see him debate an Israel only advocate. Anyone. I know, I know right? And, Even and Bradley, Bradley wanted not. to do it. The Bradley, Bradley challenged them, and... Um, you know, and he was he was basically going to even put forth like a two on two challenge um, and do like something like that. But, you know, Preston wanted none, none of it with, with good reason. I mean, that could be let's face it. There's always he's always going to have his little crowd that, you know, that believes everything he says and thinks it makes sense no matter what he says. Right. He could say the sky is purple and they they. Um, but, you know, the 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 reality is, is that him being held up to a true I.O. or who knows his stuff they'd realize that, all right, Don's view is not as ironclad as he claims, you know, um, right. and, it, and it would cause some trouble for him. And, and when I did have the opportunity months back to go on his YouTube channel and I lit it up like the 4th of July, um, <laughs> you know, I, I that, that from that that point, I think I grabbed like just looking at the subscribers that that took place after that. I, I think that was the point where I went from like two to 240, like quick, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, so, so people saw that, and a lot of people that comment today and reach out to me today say that they saw my comments on Don's channel, and that's how they found me. So it, I think Don knows that, and he doesn't really want to associate with it for, in fear of losing some of his following, even if it's just a small portion, you know? Yeah, and that's really dishonest. You should go where the evidence best lead. If a guy has a stronger argument than you— mm-hmm. And I mean, he's presenting plenty of good reasons why you should accept his argument. You should right. be willing to do that, especially you should be willing to place your pride to the side and say, OK, I was wrong. Exactly. But of course, I'm going to do this because they're really invested into this yeah. and re- they, they want that hope. They really want that entire fairy tale story, that fairy tale ending that you read about in the New Testament. Absolutely, man. And like I, I was telling uh, one of my buddies last night, uh, that, you know, about Don Preston and, and everything. And, you know, when you write books, like you can make some money, right? Like f- for me, when, when I, um, when I sold the kingdom of Christ, like I sold a, a fair amount of books and, and then with the Genesis of Israel, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely probably, I made, you know, a handful of thousands of dollars on those two books. And wow. so, you know, like, and, and it wasn't, trust me, it's not about the money. Cause I eat that in pizza every year. All right. Um, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> It's it, and that's not not I'm not even lying like I'm a pizza fanatic. But uh, the the point of it all is that, you know, Don yes. writes what he's got 25 books out. And I'm sure I'm positive that Don sells way more books than I ever sold. So you, if you do the math and you look at all the books that he's written, all the books that he's sold. And if you look at the monetization ads that he puts on his YouTube videos, that's that's the reason why he did 300 plus videos of Corinthians, because if he gets 300 videos and 500 views per video, that means that every time he gets a click, he gets an ad and a chance of earning revenue from those ads. So, wow. you know, it, it, he's, if I had to guess, I would say Don is making a pretty decent living off of his books and his YouTube channel. And of course, you know, when you have that as your primary source of income, you're definitely not going to give it up easily. So for him to come out and admit that, yeah, IO is right. 
which he knows, obviously, um, then he he would obviously give up or risk giving up a lot of financial support. And at that that stage of life, I mean, you know, you can almost relate to him a little bit like that's got to be a scary thing, you know? Yeah, yeah they had an older it, but... <laughs> Right. You don't condone it. They had an older guy I was talking to yesterday and I shared uh, some Israel only material with him. And at yeah. the end of the day, he says, well, look, I'm too old. I'm not changing my mind. And uh, he was satisfied where he was. Right. Now, now I, could, I get that. All right. Yeah. I could get that with the older folks. Uh, yep. they, they, they feel like it's too late. Well, it doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm made, I made up my mind. Regardless of what you show them, they're not going to change their mind. Exactly. And I, I don't think it's the same thing with Don, though. I think there's more to it with Don. Like Don argued with me over an article I put out called where the Gentiles Hellenized Jews. And there's a word in there. It's called, um, I forget the Greek word, but if you reference it, it's, it, I think it's Helen and then it's Helena or something like that. Okay. They have the exact same definition though. They, right. It doesn't change. If you reference it, it's under the same reference number. Right. And he tried to argue until the cows came home that those words were completely different. And I'm telling, I'm like, Don, tell me the difference. Where, where's the difference at? Because it's from okay. Romans 116, and then it's in John, I think it's John 735. The term Greek there is Helen. Right. And then the one in Romans 116, it's, it's translated Greek as well, but it's just spelled a little different in the Greek. Just yeah. very little different, but it's the same meaning. And he oh, tried yeah. to argue, he tried to argue something that he didn't have to argue because the definition right. is already given for you. So it's like a little hidden motive behind him or whatever. I don't, I don't know. Well, that's like his pleroma argument, the fullness, you know, oh, like, oh God, how, how gross is that, man? Like, you know, it's he, he the, the clear meaning and definition of the word is to be filled up to capacity. Right. And and he, he argues that this fullness of the Gentiles that R Romans 11 speaks of is the point in time where the Gentiles would reach equal status as the Jews. <laughs> but that had already that was already a reality. In fact, the previous chapter in Romans 10, Paul says there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Right. So this this argument of that being, you know, speaking of the, the equal status of Jew and Gentile is completely laughable. And, and he, yet he tries to argue that this word fullness does not necessitate or does not mean numerical fullness, even though pretty much every translation and every scholar known to man translates it as you know fullness so right it's just he, he's just super dishonest and um it's unfortunate because you know i used to be friends with the guy we, we he published my book he um we we had a lot of back and forth on the book and you know communication when i was in the inconsistent prep camp and you know and he he and he really you know raved about the clarity that i taught with and then all of a sudden when i started getting a little too clear for him <laughs> It, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it went sideways, but oh, well, what can you do? Hmm. Yeah, and that entire argument in itself, what he tried to say it was going to that would happen when they reach equal status. And yeah. then, of course, he tries to use verses like I think it's Isaiah chapter nine and seven to show that there's a continuation of the kingdom. You right. know, that gets blown out the water. Number one, when you understand Isaiah is not even speaking about the time of Jesus. Exactly. But look at Jesus speaking about the kingdom in Matthew 13. Where do yep. you get a continuation? You know, he says, uh, compares it to so many things like a net being tossed into the ocean. It, right. That is all that is going to get. You know, it wait. They wait until it's full. Then they pull it to shore and separate the good from the bad. Right. And that's, that's the, the harvest at the end of the age. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's the harvest. That's the kingdom. So the kingdom does reach a status of what? Full. full. Fullness. Yep. You know, it's nothing yep. else coming in beyond that. And that was the point when all Israel was saved. <laughs> oh, preach it, Jason. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's it's pretty cool though, having having come first full circle to totally confused, to semi-confused, to just a little confused, and now not saying we have it all figured out, because there's still a ton of things that I don't know and you know, and that you know we're working on and there's symbolism all over the old testament. And obviously Adam is still a very tricky um point. But the one thing that I can say with certainty is that a, you know, salvation was only for Israel, and b, Adam's curse went away when the coming of the Lord took place for His saints. That that's the whole story. There is no curse uh, today because that curse has been removed. You know. And isn't that good news? That is good news. And people hate on it. They think that we're, <laughs> we, you know, we're demons. But they're like, no, I want to be cursed. Damn it. You know, it's like, wow. <laughs> 
<laughs> Leave me and my sins alone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to cuddle them. <laughs> well, uh, I appreciate you coming on the show, Jason. Thank you for taking time to answer my questions. Yeah, and I uh, also want to thank everyone that took time to listen. Hope you guys enjoyed it and perhaps learned something. Yeah, definitely. Thanks Jason. for having me, dude. dude. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. You have any closing remarks you want to leave with the people? Uh, nope. That's that's pretty much it, man. I'm just going to um, probably uh, sacrifice a, a goat to Yahweh and have a cup of coffee. So. <laughs> it, is the, it is the Lord's Day, Jason. That's so you right. Make sure that's you do right. that. All right, man. All right. Take care, brother. You too. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.